But let's get into now our our outdoor dungeon. I wanted to I wanted to do something a little bit different here. In past dungeons, they have been confined areas, uh, temples above or below ground, caves, uh, things that we would stereotypically consider to be a dungeon. Even our casino heist that we planned earlier was within the kind uh, was it within the confines of a riverboat. With with this, there are ways to present an outdoor dungeon, so to speak, or a challenge. That's not just a skill challenge, not a broad narration of things, but a way to actually present uh, content through which your party moves, but in an outdoor location. And we can touch on a few of those concepts. This is going to dovetail somewhat into what Dragon Turtle Games spoke of yesterday in his interview as a content creator. And I have the DMG open, we'll reference it. Though for those of you out there who have experience making dungeons or encounters, you are certainly welcome to say, "Oh, let's plot or, or uh, let's plot or plan for uh, this to happen." If we go with our map that we had created, uh, you know uh, this this Outlands map. In fact, we have. So, this area here is Mesotopia, effectively. And even where you see the pencil going, this is even the outlands of what people could have some far-fetched claim of legal ownership of the lands in, uh, in Mesotopia. As the party continues north and east to try and head off these expeditionary forces of the invading empire we can run a dungeon in an outdoor location. It can have similar confines as a... Uh, it can have similar confines as a... Uh, as a dungeon, though with a more natural flair to it, in a, above and beyond caves. And we're doing this with the thought that, well, we'd have to consider what level do we want these characters to be when they head through this dungeon. Do they have access to the fly spell? Can they swim? Uh, what, what could be going on here? Or do we do we want it lower so they're going to have to get through that way? Or or do we want it to be a higher level encounter? And we say, look, this is going to be optional. Here's a mission that you can take. We as the DM, we as agents of the uh, Mesotopian Alliance want you to go and investigate this canyon because we understand that they, uh, the Imperials are using this as a supply base and we can't have this continue on. And, it, you know, it might be that's the treasure, that's part of the loot that they're going to receive. Um, they can find out a lot of information or if they really don't want to take that mission, you don't have to railroad your players into going into a particular place. But you can incentivize them. You know, it's that, it's that old adage of you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And then it continues. However, you can make it thirsty. So that's something to bear in mind. How would we want to make our characters thirsty to explore this dungeon? And not just to fly over it or... Um, nuke it from above with fireballs or something along those lines. Because if you're low level, eh, you're going to foot slog through it anyway. If it's higher level, you have a lot more options. So I figured what we could do is maybe set something up. It doesn't even have to be on this map. But just, just conceptualize with me right now. Let's say that we have some kind of a valley, an east-west valley. Maybe the pass gets really narrow, kind of goes out from there. And there's another choice that they can take, and they can go up here. There we 
go. Just kind of randomly drawing in some rock formations. They don't necessarily have a purpose right now, but these are things that we can talk about and we can we can continue on with as we're designing. And maybe through here we can actually have There we go. We can have a river kind of meandering its way through. And let's actually have it go up and through this passageway here. So if the characters want to take door number one, they're really going to have to try and earn it. There we go. Now we can fill this in. Oh, I don't think that's what I wanted. Heh. There we go. Yeah, we could do something like that. Uh, if we want to even say that this is a waterfall here, we can indicate that and put something secret, bubonic one. So now the concept that we'll have for this dungeon, as I was saying, uh, we could make it a little bit like uh, Valkyria Chronicles. I don't know if any of you have watched that or played that. Um, I can find something here real quick okay I think this is this is a game that is set in a fantasy World War II-esque era okay and I want to just I, I, I want to give you a glimpse at the, the, con the concept that I'm having for this dungeon suspicious so there's an invasion going on and let's let's watch how this tutorial plays out at the university right guilty as charged i get so into it so here's our party they're getting themselves together be watching me gunfire everyone keep your heads down over there training anyway well they're probably just a small scouting team we should be able to take them out i'm with you yeah let's so, do it friggin yep. family murderers jeez the commentary scouts, why are they openly attacking everybody all right about saving the game uh, open the menu so triangle, this is the yada, tutorial yada, yada. we'll go through yeah. it, it anyway, it'll talk a little bit it. about the strategy and okay here's so the plan. This is how you can deliver this kind of outdoor content to a, a okay. scrappy military band. Okay, we've got to eliminate band. the Imperial okay. Scouts that are uh, approaching Brule. We'll deploy here. We'll yeah. We'll deploy from here and take out all three of them. 
Just cross the bridge and take them down as fast as you can. Our objective here is to, to eliminate all enemies. Let's take care of them one at a time, nice and easy. Okay, so in order to win, you must kill all your enemies, and you will lose if Alicia or Welkin dies or 20 turns pass. That whole 20 turns passing thing, that is... Um, that's for every single level in the game, I'm fairly certain, and sometimes it's even less. Sometimes you have, like, a time limit. So, here's that. The they give you the map, so, and then you can strategically move through it. Um, I don't need to go much further because a unit, as you can see, this, you have is, a this is the whole point. You're going to navigate um, your way through you would just go ahead and as the players and it will cancel in this out. environment. It's outdoors. Uh, another thing about this and mode is you that can even you use the outdoors right for now. cover uh, right or now for I'm advantage in certain situations. Stick, you know, the control stick to actually move it. But if you're at really close range or your target is very... All right, so that gave you a splash of, of what we're getting into, right? There, there's a meta conversation around this campaign and especially around the dungeons. Real Dorgrim, it's not in Japanese. I'm not watching Harumph. Oh, Dorgrim the purest. <laughs> so when you make this content, you have your party of characters. You as a DM should know generally who's good at what, uh, the roles that each of them play in combat, the roles that they have for skills. And you can move from here. And as you're sitting down designing, now this is purposeful designing for your party. This was different than what uh, Dragon Turtle Games was talking about when he was discussing designing for uh, designing for a mass market. And you can say, oh, well, maybe there's a maybe there is a trail, right? Maybe there's a trail that comes along through here and uh, and we can we, we maybe it's a gravel trail and we'll have our brush, you know, kind of come in here and. You make a footpath or a wagon path. And all the while, you should be telling yourself a story. What happens here? Who uses this place? And for what? Just commerce or trade? Do people live here? Are there innocents who could be caught up in this conflict? You know, in that blurb, we saw that, you know, there was just a, a, a man and a, a, a man and a woman who were fleeing, probably like a husband and wife who lived in the village. And they had the misfortune of being outside at the wrong time. And uh, the wife ended up getting shot. If you tell yourself a story about this place, it will help it come alive. As you imagine the trading wagons that are coming and going. As you imagine the commerce or the game that travels. What type of animals live here? It's not just important for your druid to know. Eh, it's kind of a wobbly road, but you get the idea. Maybe all this here is kind of... This is all forested. Trees even kind of... The trees might even straddle the river. It might even come across and this is a path through the woods and it uh and it doesn't even end until you get if we want this to be a waterfall you know all the mist and everything is going to pour out over here lots of good uh, room for trees to grow so we do something like this and now we've introduced cover natural habitat things along those lines there we go there we uh not quite that <laughs> We'll have to put another boundary on some of these here. Maybe this has been cleared out for the crossroads. Maybe there's been bandits. And that's why they cleared out the crossroads. That kind of a thing. Then we can put little copses of trees or, or brush or something that live in, in certain areas. Right there. And... Maybe this is a little stand of trees that just exist in the base of the mountain here. Kind of doing their own thing. You found it uh, pretty playable? I It's a solid game. It has a great story. I think it was animated very well, very well voice acted. And it tells, uh, at least the first one, I only have experience with Valkyria Chronicles 1. Um, but I think it did a very good job. 
So here we do not have an indoor dungeon. It doesn't have a grid per se. Uh, you can set this up on a grid, or if you want this to even be a hex crawl dungeon, you might be able to do that. This dungeon might be a couple miles long. Right, if we have if we have our staging area over here. If we have them come into the map here, this could still be miles and miles. Now you can color code what you want this map slash dungeon to be. Maybe these orange stars are checkpoints. And so whether they're Imperial soldiers or just locals that they've conscripted or they're, or they're spies, these are going to be checkpoints along the road. Maybe no one really bothers, right? This goes over a waterfall. Ah, who's going to... There's no trading or anything. This is all just whatever over here. Uh, we can then have things like... Uh, Let's put in some kind of a base structure, right? It could be uh, some bivouacs. It could be, uh, ultimately there was a supply depot and that is going to be like the main goal. And we can have the supply depot be maybe kind of built into the mountain and we can have it be here. So at the very least, your party's going to have to sneak and or fight its way here and come down to take out the supply depot. Infiltrating, bypassing, destroying, or something, these guard posts along the way. Yeah, some maybe some guard towers. And we can put, uh, we can, depending on the scale of the map, we can put little guard stations out here. In fact, let's do that. Let's make little, um, we'll make little dark blue watchtowers. There's a watchtower here. There's one maybe up on the mountain. And there's one here. Because the checkpoint will also double as a watchtower, but it'll have more than one or two people who rotate on some kind of a shift. That means we're probably going to have one here as well. And this is going to have its own they might have a watchtower to send a signal unless if uh, enemies are coming up this way or if enemies are going to come up this road here. Let's see, the site, if you're here, you could see if they're coming around the bend, maybe right here, because that's in line with this checkpoint. And if they send up a smoke signal, then that could that could raise alarm. Which, by the way, you could offer this as a stealthy dungeon. You could offer this as a beat -em up dungeon, and who cares? It's just that if you alert the guards to your presence, they, well, they're, things are going to get tougher. So here's our waterfall, and then this drops down into a basin, and this is lower. And if we're making a DM map, we might know that there are friendly villagers who live... Uh, there's a friendly village who's been rather undetected because the, the Empire doesn't really care. They live a little out of the way here, either in the woods or just beyond it. Uh, but here, we'll, we'll put them kind of on the edge here. So right there, those are some friendly people that might even be able to be recruited to help your, uh, to help take caves or tunnel paths under the mountain, through the mountain, maybe even over the mountain. Remember, as you're designing a dungeon, even if it's for your own party, 
if you don't want to railroad them, give them several ways to interact with the dungeon that, uh, you know, look, even if they're, if everyone was uh, proficient in perception, everyone can roll ones. And all of a sudden you're like, guys, I built this dungeon for you. What happened? Why can't you see the secret passage? Look, sometimes that happens. And so here you have this village of, I don't know, we you could put in some race or another. It could be a, a bestial race. Maybe it's even an aggressive one, but one that could be neutral because they hate the Imperials more than they hate the PCs. You know, you want to put some aggressive an aggressive orc village or goblins? You could do that. Do you want to make them, I don't know, tabaxi? You could do that too. Think about the ecosystem of this place. Think about what's going on. How do the Imperial occupiers treat the people who pass through here or live here? Tin Cat says, I was playing For Honor and I was told to kill yourself the first game I played. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of these games have uh, very toxic communities um, and or 12-year-olds who want to try and speak like adults. And, <laughs> I mean, don't listen to it. If, if people have to resort to that kind of language, Tin Cat, uh, especially when it comes to a newbie, you know, someone who wants to share in the same game that they take so much joy in playing these other people, uh, I mean, they're doing a favor and they're making themselves, um, they're making themselves not an option for you to consider to trust or want to play with. Though, just remember, that may not be reflective of the community as a whole. Yeah, you know what? Don't Don't let that one person ruin that experience for you tin cat there's you're gonna find jerks everywhere i mean i've had to ban people from this channel um you know especially again if they're using language like that i would feel sorry for them if they can't express themselves in any other way than by saying that that is actually that that is very sad so have patience say wow i'm just I mean, don't tell this to him because you don't want to... I mean, don't feed the bullies or don't feed the trolls. Um, no, don't. You, you don't even have to deal with it. Yeah, Tin Cat, don't take it personally. Just... what? So what? Some random person on a video game tells you to do something? That carries no weight. That person's not an authority figure over you. That person doesn't know you. Uh, that person is just very hostile and, and sad. You know, you get on, play the game, get better, and don't reply to bullies like that. All right, no problem, Torchek. We're going to be generating the map and, and talking about the ecosystem and stuff. And uh, yeah, Torchek was correct. You need barracks for the soldiers. That could be this big supply uh, depot. Right, it's located. Uh, it's located here. Supplies are coming and going. So maybe this is a, a more direct thoroughfare to other imperial installations. When you and so this could have barracks. This could have an armory. This could have all kinds of fun stuff. When you present a map like this, even if you don't label it, or even if you label it with a very broad, these are guard towers, these are waypoints, and you know this is your your goal your players will probably start thinking oh man maybe we can uh maybe we can collapse the road on or or like uh, not collapse the road maybe we can uh, collapse rocks on these guard towers or maybe we can burn things or maybe we could just stealth the entire way don't be afraid as a dm if your players come up with a way to avoid every single encounter that you have planned reward them with that win because you've probably made it difficult to do, and by golly, if they did it, that is a victory. They don't have to kill every Imperial soldier. Now they can, and you you can plan for that too. Um, or even if they want to combine the two, how do they stealth kill their way through the entire valley? Hmm. If this is a couple miles long, they'd have to move fast, quick, and be professional about it before a shift changes. But this allows for a lot of thinking. It does allow for three D and D. In other words, you can fight up and down, not just laterally. Yeah, Delcorin isn't that the solution to everything? 
Tin Cat says, when I died, I was at the hospital. The closest thing I can compare it to is the people who recall astroplaning. I still have nightmares about it. Oh, you mean in, um, you actually, Tin Cat, you mean IRL, not, uh, not in a video game. I thought you were talking about the game that you were playing. So here is our dungeon, okay? We can now conceptualize the different events or hazards that can exist inside of it. I won't need that for the interview anymore. So here we go. Oh my. We'll put that up there. Let's put this over here. And we'll also consult the DMG. Simple goal. If this is the... Oh. Can I roll or pick a chromatic dragon color for you? Sure. Let's bring this up real quick. We'll roll a d6. A 3. So it's going to be either a blue or a bronze. And then we'll do odds blue, evens bronze. Odds, you have a blue dragonborn. Oh, you even said chromatic anyway? Well, there you go. You got a blue. Even even the cosmic fates wanted you to have a blue. Dorgrim says, whenever I'm stuck trying to move forward with encounters, I use the five-room dungeon method. Would you like to discuss that over here, uh, Dorgrim? Offhand, that doesn't necessarily come to mind. Tin Cat, it's pretty crazy. I was dead once for eight seconds and then 21 seconds. Luckily, no major brain damage, but my depression and anxiety have gotten a lot worse since it happened. Well, what, what happened, Tin Cat? Like, was this a random thing, like, struck by lightning and who could have figured? Or, my gosh. Uh, if you want to talk about it, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, you know, you don't have to give up personal details like that. <laughs> Mantaron, yeah, some Fusro Da in here. We can even hint at some optional goals, right? You can um, kill as many Imperials as possible, um, loot or disable the, uh, the checkpoints or buildings, aid the locals. There might even be something like an NPC encounter. Maybe there's like some old farmer on the road here who's getting harassed or is in is in need of having his wagon fixed. And if you if you help the old farmer with his wagon full of hay, maybe the old farmer can actually have the party members hide in the hay and take them past the checkpoint. Discover the secret behind the waterfall. Oh, uh, 
I'm sorry. If it has been a few months, Bubonic One, you'll have to forgive me. Dorgrim says the five room trick entrance with a guardian, puzzle or RP challenge, trick or setback, big climax, and the re uh, reward and revelation. All right. Thank you for posting the link, Dorgrim. And Bubonic One, thank you for initially bringing that up. And I'm sorry that I forgot. Tin Cat is cool with it. I'd been on medication for ADHD uh, to counter the medication so you can sleep. And medicine for anxiety when my doctor also decided to diagnose me with depression. It was about five years ago and I was 16. So the the cocktail got to you or something? Like there was a it was a bad mixture and you ended up dying. Now, if we take uh, the if we take what Dorgrim and Bubonic had referenced here, there are most likely going to be patrols or even a stray imperial or something along those lines. Like just because you have towers doesn't mean that they haven't sent people out here or especially are hiding in the woods to make sure that uh, there aren't anyone uh, coming along this route. Or maybe even they decided to. You know, if they're, if they're concentrated here, maybe a lot of the game in, in here has uh, been hunted. Or vegetation, or mushrooms, or whatever. Or even, they could learn, what if these woods are considered to be haunted, right? Maybe they're haunted because of the locals. And so they actually do their hunting in the grasslands here, and in the forest here. So there, you could have that entrance with the Guardian fairly straight in. In the beginning part of this dungeon, you would explain this is what it looks like. Do you want to run at daytime or nighttime? That's going to be up to you. If we stick with just the Imperial races, yeah, there's humans, but there's also tieflings. And tieflings can see in the dark. They don't need torches. That said, that is the that is the majority race, or the dominant race anyway. So are there more tieflings than humans? Maybe not. So that maybe your common Imperial soldier is actually a human. In that case, your party uh, could scout ahead or could have this knowledge, especially if we have agents of the Empire within the party itself. And, and think about this, too. If we have a spy from the Empire or these soldiers who defected, um, wouldn't that be interesting? Think of the role play as we get into uh, number two, as Dorgrim's talking about. You could go up and um, try and role play around here. You could flash those military credentials and, you know, say, oh, yeah, this is going on. Or uh, well, what's that trick from Star Wars where it looks like um, Han Solo was turning in Chewbacca for a ransom and then Chewbacca just sort of went nuts? Well, here you could have the soldiers, the, the brother-sister soldiers, trying to turn in the, the these stray uh, people from Mesotopia. And suddenly that's when they ambush the Imperial Party, who was either armed and maybe armored, but they were a hunting party. Maybe they weren't ready for combat, so we slowly escalate, right? We have some uh, hunters or trappers out here. And then we get to the soldiers who are in their defensible stations. They might learn along the way that if there is a problem, there is a signal whistle, and that whistle could very easily bounce around. Well, maybe more so here. At the same time, there's also a babbling brook. So you have to watch out where you're at if you want to try and stealth it or go for a kill before um, go for a kill before they can blow their whistle or light a signal fire, depending on the time of day. Uh, well, Delcorn, you may have missed uh, Star Wars Day, but it is now Revenge of the Fifth. <laughs> Dorgrim collects lots of resources because you never know what you're going to need. That is true, Dorgrim. You know, a TRD, the real Dorgram, is the SRD. So let's even use this five, uh, as you all brought it up here. If we just bare bones this, if we just say they're, they're not going to do anything else 
besides go for the supply depot. We have an initial hunting party encounter. From there, the puzzle could be figuring out how to get by without triggering the alarms, or that could be the role playing if they want to come up. Because look, even if we didn't have a group of Imperial defectors, they could steal the uniforms from the hunters that they initially encounter in this so-called dungeon. And they can try and role play through. So here, puzzle a way to sneak past towers. RP as soldiers. You then have a trick or setback. Well, at some point in time, someone's going to ask for papers, please, or is going to uh, is going to notice them in some way, and then we can have a race, almost, you know, a race to the alarm. Um, how how could uh, how could we suppress the bell? How could we, if the bell is rung, how can we role play through? the Titan security that will most likely be over here. That can be something of a sensitive issue. Do you want to force a so-called failure on your players? Or can you as a DM explain, this happened, can you deal with it? All the other station knows, especially, look, there's a waterfall here that's probably echoing. They may have heard the bell, or maybe not. Or they might just go into a defensive mode and are going to be more strict on what's going to happen. So now in this first half of the dungeon on the approach, uh, you've had wandering bands of soldiers. You could have encountered a stationary little group. This is like a sub boss right here if you wanted to go this route. Or if you don't and everyone knows how to breathe water or something, maybe they want to go in the river. But there could be dangers in the river. You could be dashed against rocks. There could be creatures inside of it. So your river can be dangerous for different reasons as well. So this is the mini boss, and this is kind of this halfway point, you know, this this uh, setback. Maybe they defeat it, but with the dying gasp, the last soldier, ding da ding, ding da ding, ding da ding, manages to at least weakly ring the alarm bell, causing possible doubt. They, yeah, they, they could even be chased there. In fact, uh, the the Imperial uh, soldiers, if they rally and chase them, they're like, oh, well, nothing, you know, we don't need to find bodies. They went down the waterfall. No one's going to survive that because that's how villains think. <laughs> Imperial scum, Jedi for the win. The Emperor keeps guacamole on his throne's armrest because he's the leader of the Avocati. <laughs> Uh, so then we have some kind of a, uh, a big climax. Alerted guards equals harder combat slash sneaky. This could mean, however, now look, you've now given your players a little bit more room to get around. Are they willing to climb over the rocks? It's slower. You could be out of sight. You could also be way more vulnerable if you're spotted. Where are you going to run if you're clinging to a mountainside? Maybe you want to go that way. Maybe you do go over the waterfall and you have this random encounter here. This could be a climax as well as, as these people might have some kind of a challenge for you. Maybe to prove that you're not with the Imperium or something. And then they could actually deliver you to the, you know, maybe they have um, a big hollow tree root or some or a cave that goes from this forest over here. And that's actually why there is um, a forest that's growing over here. What do the Imperials know or care? That's just wood. They can cut it down or hunt in it. But maybe they don't realize that uh, th these trees are getting their water from the river or something along those lines. And of course, you're the good guys and you care about nature. And so you would understand that. <laughs> but you, have, you, you can have a climax here either way. Things are a lot harder. You've had your warm-up. You've introduced the dungeon and mechanics to your players. And so now that we have a big climax, and that's going to go into a boss fight. 
Uh, so we could almost uh, make a, a subsection here for four. Whoop. Why, why did this just reformat? That's... Grr. Don't reformat, please. Do you even have to kill the boss? Maybe not even directly. If there's a barracks here, there's probably an armory here. If there's an armory here and we have an external empire that is probably more technologically advanced than the people living a quainter lifestyle in Mesotopia, well, as Bubonic once said, it could be set on fire. It's probably made of mostly wood. This is an invading forest. Do you think they have the time to quarry the rock out of the mountains? Not when there's abundant wood everywhere. You could set it on fire. You could blow it up. Uh, you could even... Oh, jeez. I don't know. What else could you do? I mean, if you just sort of killed your way all the way through this dungeon, uh, there's other things. You could... Um, I don't know. You could poison the well or something. <laughs> now, you could argue that poison isn't necessarily a good tactic, but then again, this is war. Uh, but there are there are different ways to have this big climax in your dungeon. What is the boss fight? Because we can stat. I mean, we can go to the monster manual, and he could be some. Uh, he can be some big bruiser hobgoblin, and, and if we want to reskin him as something else, or ooh, th this would be a good one too. Um, cockatrice. Oh, we're almost there. If we're saying that tieflings are more officers, there's not as many tieflings. Aha, a cambion. Um, a cambion would be a very good uh, officer. A cambion would be a good leader. Still looks like a tiefling can be reskinned as one. Or if you really want to maybe show some, you know, as a DM, do you want to show, uh, you want to tip your hand a little bit? Maybe some tieflings aren't just half devils. Maybe some are three quarters maybe some are almost full or are tin cat when my mom asked what happened apparently the pharmacy had given me the wrong prescription instead of my antidepressants they gave me one of the most powerful antipsychotics on the market the antidepressant was to be taken three times a day so i did but the antipsychotic is so strong, it has to be crushed and taken slowly throughout the day. I ended up ingesting four times the lethal dose. Whew. Wow, Tin Cat. What was the fallout from that? My gosh. And uh, hello, Arachnicognito. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Yeah, uh, and you know what, Dark Wolf? If you don't want to just blow up the supply depot, if the party is feeling confident... What about stealing a supply wagon and taking all of the Imperial supplies back to the Mesotopian base, right? If you have to report back, you have to do two things. Destroy the supply depot and report back. Could the PCs argue, hey, we killed everyone. Maybe you used a poison or something, so it's clear. Uh, that could be a destroy effect. Or you could just blow it up or burn it down. And report back, but you didn't say we, you know, we had to report back with nothing. In fact, look, we just, we freed up a hundred swords. Here, here is gear. In fact, here, uh, also, here is uh, Imperial Army uniforms that other people can wear to try and reverse infiltrate the infiltrators. That could be a, a goal as well. But your party is going to determine which course of action to take. Do you just want to blow it up and be the cool guys who walk away slowly from it, never turning back? Do you want to really try and spy it and thieve it and, and loot the place? 
either without anyone knowing or by killing everyone or by, I don't know, something. Oh, I see Tin Cat. Dorgum says, in my opinion, tieflings aren't half-fiends. They have trace amounts of fiendish blood. Cambians are the true half-fiends. Well, yeah, it's like saying half-dragons are, you know, are, uh, well, they're half-dragon. Cambians are more um, more of that. In fact, Mordenkainen's uh, book is going to get into that uh, a lot more. So this is, um, th that's true. I mean, you so you could say the dragonborn are like a quarter dragon and tieflings are like a quarter <laughs> they're they're the diet coke of evil <laughs> or the diet or the diet coke of dragon uh though this could this could end up being a more intense encounter because the party may the party should know tieflings because tieflings live in mesotopia but suddenly you put a cambion as the you know the colonel that's what that is uh, watching over this garrison this valley fortress um, or if a couple of the, it's not even just one, if a couple of the high ranking members, um, are Cambians or something else like that. I mean, there's devils and demons you could choose from all throughout the monster manual, uh, including kind of a neutral third faction in the, in the blood war. Uh, they are the, oh, it begins with a Y. It, uh, I think it, it's like the Yi Chow or something like that. Oh, shoot. Do any of you know who I'm talking about? The Blood War is the war between the demons and devils, and there's kind of like um, a third party that sells to both sides. Yugoloths. Gotcha. There you go, Dorgrim. Yugoloths. Dragonborns are very weak and half dragons. True half dragons are way more powerful. And uh, ooh, looks like uh, Delcorn did something similar. Your doc prescribed a much higher dose than I should have been given and knocked me out. It was more of a sedative than antidepressant. Turned out to be an antipsychotic instead of an. Oh my gosh. Woo. What stories? You know what? And, and here we presume that we're living, you know, the modern age. It's 2018. Everything should be tracked with bar labels and automatic chemical interaction warnings and things like that. And yet this has. <laughs> the real Dorgrim earns his XP passively through nonviolence, surprisingly. So you can use this, especially if this is a lower level dungeon, to reveal what they might be encountering more of later in the campaign. In fact, maybe even the big boss character, uh, you know, they have a fly speed of 60 feet. The boss character might just wing it out of there, pun intended. And you'll meet that character again, maybe in another dungeon Right? Another strike in a confined area with a certain set of circumstances. Um, and so then we get into, by the way, here's our five. And that was the um, that was the rewards and revelation. Oh, come on. There we go. I'll just put revealing info. Imperial info. Rewards are bare minimum for job completion. Extended rewards for optional encounters. And up here this, and we can cycle back, kill as many Imperials as possible. We could then make a line saying loose change in pockets, loot, disable checkpoint buildings. Uh, I don't know, a nice set of armor or something along those lines. You can go through and add extra points, bullet points to this outline. If you want to reward these individual things, you know, do you want to aid? Uh, do you want to aid the old farmer with the hay wagon? He might not have anything to actually give you. But if you ever pass through this way again, maybe you've temporarily earned the background feature from the uh, from the folk hero, 
right? You're a folk hero. He's going to go back to his village and he's going to tell people about you all. And so everyone in the party has earned that background feature in that specific region. And that could be a great reward, especially if you're going to have Imperials chasing after you. So it's not monetary directly, but it can be very useful. Or if you discover the secret behind the waterfall, maybe this is something that even the locals in the village at the base of the waterfall don't know about. Maybe they're afraid to go in the cave. They know about the cave and they're afraid, or they don't even know about it for whatever reason. Uh, they just leave it alone or they never considered going back there. You know, if it's a village of tabaxi, they don't want to get wet. <laughs> Something like that. Um, and so that could actually have, if they are really willing to go out of their way in a dungeon, that could be something uh, powerful, a great reward. And maybe one that does require, um, even require a little bit of aiding the locals to get. That way you're earning it, not just by curiosity or luck, but you're still having to do a good deed. Or I'll tell you what, the, the secret behind the waterfall can be its own mini dungeon. It could be it could be its own mini dungeon. You could have a sub five room encounter behind the waterfall, and wouldn't that be fun? A dungeon in a dungeon. <laughs> yep, a mini dungeon. If you don't believe me, the half dragon provides the following bonuses: four strength, two con, two wisdom, two charisma. Oh wow! Uh, Tin Cat uh, is actually going into the experience he had while he was while he was dead. Um, but like I was saying, the entire time I was coded as well as while I was dead I was pretty much floating above my body I could see what was happening and I watched myself die and get brought back it was terrifying my mom didn't believe when I told her uh, until I described her exactly what she did the entire time she got a lot more religious after that uh, I could move around slightly I could go out the room slightly to watch my mom but it was honestly just so terrified I stayed near my body That's a very fascinating story, Tin Cat, and it's a personal one, too. Uh, I'm happy that you are comfortable in this community enough to uh, to share that kind of a thing. I mean, that, that's a very, you know, that, that's a powerful, that could be a very intimate thing, and thank you for sharing that. Uh, and Bubonic, yes, uh, so the closer to a dragon you are, the more of those aspects you will be. Keeping this as a guideline, then, it would really be up to us to generate the content as our players go through. Do we want to make a DM map and have patrol positions? You know, we could save a copy like this, and and the players, the players might even just get this. This is what they know, except maybe not the star down here. Uh, but they would know that there's a waterfall, and it kind of goes off. Um, you know, it's empty, but there's not even Imperials there. So why would anyone want to go there, of course? <clears throat> uh, and then for our our player map or our DM map, we can add in a patrol route. You know, maybe it's like a little figure eight. They they come up this way, then they come down through the woods, and then they come up. And you can even set uh, like a, a clock, like little little marks. Where are they every fifteen minutes on this patrol route? As they are either hex crawling, or if you do want to keep it as just an open loosey goosey map, this will better help you know the routes of your patrols. Maybe there's one here, um, and there might not even be a patrol here because they know that there's a river that it, it, maybe it moves too swiftly, it's deep, or there are monsters or hungry things that live in there. So they're like, eh, whatever. We're not worried about it. We're not going to put someone on this little island. Uh, we're just going to make a secure checkpoint. And this is a bottleneck anyway going into the woods. So this doesn't have patrols, but it, do it does have a stronger presence at the end. 
Uh, this is also where you can encounter some NPCs, and you could even generate that not all the NPCs are kindly village folk. Some of them might be spies themselves. Can your party discern that on an interaction with the uh, farmer with the wheel broken on his wagon? You know, would an insight help or a, a, some kind of a background feature or a spell or something along those lines? You can approach it from several different angles. So they can choose to take the the more dodgy, like stealthy, killy method, or they can take a direct, maybe a little bit more role play method here until they get to the bottleneck. And then the two can blend or split or intensify as you either have possibly hostile locals to work with or more hostile Imperials who are on some other kind of alarm level because of what happened. And you might even say as a DM, I'm willing to accept that due to some circumstance, this isn't accelerated at all. Maybe they, maybe they role played things so well that there's no need to raise the alarm and they actually just get snuck through, you know, move along. You're, you're um, Indiana Jones who snuck into Berlin to get your father's journal back. Uh, and you, there you are as a part of um, a, a, a parade, a Nazi parade. And uh, you get your book back and, you know, Hitler himself looks at the book, opens it, autographs it, gives it back to you and kind of says, you know, move along, move along. You can pull off that kind of a stunt. I, as a DM, I'm not trying to kill my players. I want them to succeed, but I also want them to earn it. Because that's also where I, I get my measure personally. If I challenge them and I see them creatively thinking and overcoming ways, if they're outsmarting me as the guy who's pre-planning everything, oh, thank you. That's amazing. And I feel justified as a DM that I did a good job. And th your players are going to feel excellent for doing it too. Yeah, Dorgrim. <laughs> and you know what? Watch, watch movies like that. Watch Indiana Jones. And by the way, if, if you did not know this, uh, and IMDB will back me up, there are a lot of reasons why things in Indiana Jones seems cheesy and over the top. Because the movie itself was supposed to draw from the comics of that era and that style. That were these over the top adventures. And of course, you know, all, all the bad guys spoke uh, accented English. Um, you know, uh, all of this was going on. So uh, it, it, it is in some ways meant to be corny or hackneyed you're as a dm does that fit the mood of your campaign do you want this to be uh do you want this to be a uh, a very like vibrant spunky adventure uh set in the countryside you know you have very this simple small. you don't want to you have a simple band of soldiers like, here see, you know who's going through quaint you know un unadulterated uh so instead of using the uh, stick, countryside use taking the out the bad guys see, or are you running this comically slower. or are you running this are you a veteran or even just a military buff who runs this as a tactical drill and who runs this with super realism? You can take all of those approaches with a concept like this. Saturday theater cliffhangers. Is that, is that kind of the name of, uh, is that the name of the genre Dorgrim? Cause it's not, I was thinking noir, but it's not like a noir detective. Mantrox succeed or die trying. Or the more fun way, BS your way to victory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's... um. Actually, that was another scene. Uh, although I think that was in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and not uh, Last Crusade. It's uh, when Indiana Jones was in the submarine compound, and uh, he had just stolen a... Uh, he had stolen a guard's uniform, and a guard came up and started... Of course, the guard was talking German then, because you weren't supposed to know what he was saying. And, uh, and so you saw this guard like talking down to Indy and he just, he stands up, he's like, oh, and, uh, the vest was too small. So he's like, and he's playing along. He like combs his hair cause he was like looking sloppy. So this guy, this uh, officer was berating Indiana and, uh, and so he's like, oh yeah, yeah uh, this. And, and then he just goes Poof, like <laughs> right across and knocks the other guy out and takes his uniform instead. Uh, so <laughs> being able to, uh. Uh, to BS your way to victory, uh, you know, to blather, to charm, to offer uh, monetary favors. Because look, maybe not all the soldiers out here are happy and 100% loyal to the Imperium. 
Some of them can be conscripted. Some of them might have their families in danger. You know, if they fail their service, maybe their family will fall on hard times or just be killed. You could bribe. You could offer favors. Um, I mean, depending on depending on the people at your table, it could be intimate favors. Uh, you know, whatever the level of your campaign, uh, and that's appropriate for people, get through it. Be imaginative. South Elite! Good morning, South Elite! <laughs> Dorgrim, I think the I think the theme, but not the actual name. There were shorts in between the movies, and each one ended in a cliffhanger. Ah. Sotha, welcome. We are discussing designing an outdoor dungeon. Yes, creativity is key, and 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 not just creativity, um, or to go hand in hand with it, Mantarok, or I'm sorry, like uh, slithery otherworld appendage to slithery otherworld appendage. Um, flexibility. This kind of a dungeon is going to be very tough for DMs who have to have control of everything. If you have to have your players on a railroad. I mean, look, there's times and places, or if your characters like an on-rail shooter style uh, dungeon campaign, that's fine. But if you have the personality as a DM that you feel like you have to be in control, or you're uncomfortable facing new challenges or improvisation... This kind of a concept is not going to work well. And what you might want to do, even if you like this, what you would say is, oh, the Imperials have uh, made a have made a fence. Uh, you know, you start them over here. And then you say the Imperials have made a palisade or some sort of like a, a, a barricade along the river over here. And so you've made this, but it's off limits. I don't know, something along those lines. So you can take this concept and you're kind of funneling them along. Also, if you think that your players will get distracted very easily, when they start infiltrating this place here and they start coming along, you can introduce a patrol force or a natural disaster or something happening behind them, forcing them to have to make progress in. Uh, what if, uh, what if suddenly, you know, it, it, what this wasn't in the intelligence reports? Uh, suddenly, there's actually uh, a gr uh, like a, a very a professional group of soldiers. We're not talking about guards and posts. We're talking like a, a detachment of the of the inner circle army from the far northeast imperial division, whatever, and uh, they are actually marching up behind the players in order to uh, secure or otherwise, uh, I don't know, do a check. In fact, you could even say, yeah, they're coming by and they're they're doing their checks up here, especially if you're that, that type of DM who likes to stay in control. So the wall will prevent the contact until this professional group makes their way past here and checks the checkpoint themselves. And now, woo, 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 we really got to hurry. Because these are men and women who don't, uh, they're not going to take prisoners, or if they do, they're not going to treat you kindly. And they probably can't be bribed with anything. So if you even wanted, you can push your players forward with something happening. No rails and outdoor adventures because your players are going to break off the rails fast. You should prepare for that. You know, you'll hope that the players will, get, will take the wink and the nudge, you know, the off the off screen one. And say, well, we're probably sticking to here. But you might have creative ones. Look, you might have a druid saying, I'm going to turn into a giant eagle. And I am going to fly over the mountains and land in here. I'm going to detonate the munitions and fly back. Okay. You completed the goal. You won the dungeon. You did. And, and you don't need to be sarcastic. You don't need to be passive aggressive. As the DM, you ex this is what you expect to happen. Now, if your players do that, they have missed out on all of this other stuff. They don't get extra rewards, extra experience, whether you're doing experience or milestones. Uh, they miss contacts. They miss uh, all sorts of stuff. They completed it, and maybe they each got, I don't know, 
you give them you give them 200 gold to split among the party and a thank you note from the commander for doing a, a job well done if they take their time to liberate <laughs> to liberate uh, enemy uniforms if they bring back 200 swords that were in the supply depot if they um, I don't know if they help the local village, uh, like like the humanoid villagers, let alone the locals of whatever beast tribe or whatever orcs that are at the bottom. You know, once you're out of the dungeon, the dungeon's done. I mean, yeah, you could revisit, but the tension, the opportunity is probably gone. So yes, you can cheese this dungeon very easily and let your players cheese it. If, if they're a low-risk, low-reward party, they're going to get... They're going to play how they want, and they're going to get what they get. And I'm not saying that in a bad way. If they don't want a lot of reward, or recognition, or loot, or money, or advancement, or whatever, this is them, you know, they'll feel creative. They'll feel like, yeah, we won. And maybe they don't care about not earning things that they didn't that they didn't know exist. Yes, allies. Especially, especially if we're playing, like, uh, spy versus spy, or, you know... Vanguard force versus like uh, counter insurgency force or whatever, as the two tendrils of Mesotopia and uh, and the uh, Shadowheart Empire are coming together and kind of tickling and making contact. You want allies. You want fortifications. If you can think about this, if your party had a way to secure this supply depot. The Mesotopian Alliance, or whatever we want to call it, will have a supply depot. They can now use this as a checkpoint, as a border patrol. They can use the the Imperials' very assets against them. So you want a hundred percent completion of this dungeon. You you get rid of the Imperials either by killing them, or I don't know, driving them up, or I don't know, gathering them together, tying them up, and. Uh, putting them in a wagon to send back to a military prison or something and you secure the resources the swords the the gunpowder i don't know the vehicles the animals the food supply the the towers uh the goodwill of the locals whether they're the beast tribe to the north or whether it's you know farmer jones who's plodding along with a hay wagon here and he lives off the map but his farmer jones's family or the village of jones or whatever um, we can do uh, Blazing Saddles and, and everyone was Johnson who lived in the town. Um, you know, you go visit the Johnsons and uh, and they'll help protect you against uh, the Imperials. They'll hide you or whatever. Tin Cat, sorry if I'm lurking. Just having anxiety and letting the stream calm you down. Well, feel, feel creative. Feel, uh, feel full of ideas, Tin Cat. You don't have to apologize for lurking. There is no requirement to lurk, to talk, to have to contribute. If you sit back and you're absorbing creativity and positivity, and this is making you consider um, your own life, IRL or in fantasy or whatever in different ways, you're doing what I'm hoping this channel does. And there is no apology needed for that. Yeah, Civil Hermit. <laughs> oh, I, I love Daya's, uh, I love his emotes. You know, I saw him, I saw him stream. I, I'm sure he's been streaming for a while, but I saw him for the first time last night, I think. And uh, he actually had a face cam. I'm like, Diatech has a face? He exists? He's not just a floating voice? <laughs> And uh, Bubonic, yeah, you know what? This could even be another mini dungeon. And you know what? Whether it's the cave behind the waterfall or the supply depot, you could run it as the the metaphorical five-room dungeon. Or these could just be five-room dungeons, a very physical representation of that. Oh, he was gone for a while, so he only came back recently? I, I think he mentioned he had eye surgery, so I don't think he has to wear glasses anymore. So he probably took some time off to be able to get uh, uh, laser surgery and heal up from that. But yeah, I saw him on camera uh, the other day and I'm just like, what is this? <laughs> There's a man behind the voice. I just don't have to follow the, uh, the, the retina tracker anymore. Well, hey, there you go, Tin Cat. 
uh, Death Count, uh, Death Count uh, can relate in his own way with you. So, did we get into, you know, particular traps? Oh, I, I bet Imperials left traps or hazards. You know, rocks can fall naturally. Or there's hunting traps. You can trap this dungeon as much as you like. Uh, tripwire alarms. They don't even have to have, I don't know, like spiky logs, like smacked together and squishy between them. It could just lead to a bunch of tin cans rattling, like, -da 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 -da, and suddenly you know that uh, the scouts know that someone has arrived. And hopefully not humanoids. Hopefully they think it's a deer or something, though they're still probably going to come. So you can trap the, the, the tar out of this place. Hunting traps. Uh, maybe if you're on the road, um, there's a pothole or something. And the pothole actually is a, it is a, a pitfall, not a pothole. Uh, because there's some kind of an underground, I don't know. There's water flowing through here. This, uh, maybe if this is on a limestone base or something, there's uh, pockets and caves. You have in the DMG random traps, obstacles, trap, uh, trap effects, hazards, mold, spiders. Uh, now, spiders don't have to be a monster you encounter. They could just be a bunch of little ones that crawl all over you, and it's a hazard because they're biting or they blind you or something along those lines. But hazards are often overlooked. The river is a hazard because there's monsters, because there's rocks in the bottom, and you could get dashed against them if you don't maintain an athletics of whatever's appropriate for the level. Uh, going over the waterfall, this this is a hazard too. So you can trap and hazard and put random monster encounters or monster quote unquote encounters if you wish. Tricks, treasures. I mean, what if for some reason they wanted to go on this island and there's actually, I don't know, uh, a bandit gang what, uh, died there maybe or uh, something. Or maybe there's a bandit that fled and uh, you, you, see, you see evidence of Imperial arrows in the backs of the corpses. Um, and uh, while you find bodies, maybe you find a map or a reference or a, a key and you're like, whoa, this has to go someplace. And they search the island and there's a random treasure chest because... The Imperials tried looting, uh, the or I'm sorry, the uh, the bandits tried looting one of the guard towers or the outpost or the supply depot, and uh, they only got this far. They they tried losing them, uh, but they died on the island. And you can recover their swag. These are all things for you to consider. Tell a tale, even if it's a murderous one or one with monsters. Dungeon dressing. There's buzzing or chanting or ringing or rustling or sobbing. Um, now, do you have to put, is this the, do you want to call this the sobbing valley? If so, why? What, what makes it sound like sobbing? You don't really have to necessarily, you don't have to go into, into that detail. But there could be all kinds of things uh, throughout here. Secret monsters. Or what if they, what if they climb up uh, this rock here and they find that there's a, there's a sphinx. And the Sphinx is kind of unemployed right now because someone answered its riddle and hasn't gotten a new command. So it doesn't really have to worry about blocking the road. And by the way, it's probably been sitting up there for 500 years. And it, it's seen a lot of stuff. Can you befriend it? Oh, sure. Hopefully. <laughs> and look at this. I mean, the DMG. You can randomly generate odors. <laughs> Do you want or need inspiration for a dungeon, whether it's outdoors or not? You want to generate a broken arrow, uh, cracks in the floor, a, a torn uh, a torn sack, or a harmless slime? Not all slimes want to eat you or your gear. Do you want to put a nest of uh, rust monsters living in the woods? <laughs> Maybe that's why everything's, uh, you know... This is all woods, and, and everyone here is wearing leather. But, of course, the Imperials aren't going to put a warning out about that. It's up to you. This is a great... This is fertile ground up here for your imagination. As a dungeon, you've told a story. You're foreshadowing what's to come later in the campaign, or even in later dungeons. And you've provided copious amounts of ways for your characters to get from their staging area, wherever you want it, to here. Heck, you want to challenge them? Or you want to maybe 
I don't know, you run a Volos campaign and you actually have a bunch of Beastmen who are in the party, maybe you want to stage them over here and they have to, you know, this is going to be something to overcome. Maybe there's not a root system, or if there is, uh, these locals, while they're talking to the Beastmen, might be non-hostile, they're not friendly, and so they're either going to have to find a way up the waterfall, good luck with that, especially with wet rocks and everything, or they're going to have to accomplish a task, and maybe this dungeon, then instead of becoming, oh, there's a, a, a mystical item, uh, slay the beast in the cave that's been hurt, like, like the Grendel, you know, <laughs> Slay the Grendel for us, and we'll help you get to the Imperial base. And you could even forego almost all this other map, except on maybe an escape or something. And they'll just take you here, you infiltrate, and suddenly, uh, if you don't want to dip out and go into further Imperial territory or into No Man's Land, right? You don't know the Joneses or the Johnsons, you know, the Johnson village down here. And so you know that this road takes you back to Mesotopian occupied area. Now, all of a sudden, you've approached this map from the east. You've had an interaction. The supply depot is really your, your like your your big, uh, that's number three. Then you run a chase encounter or a chase sequence that can be on land or on the river. What's to stop you? Customize it. Have fun. Imagine. This is a microcosm of a world. What happens here doesn't even have to be consistent with outside. If you want to make these uh, these orcs, maybe these are very friendly orcs. Maybe they're friendly gnolls, like our friend Norton the Knoll. Um, maybe they're super mean to Baxies. I don't know. It's up to you. Civil Hermit, long, long ago when he was playing Binding of Isaac, he was on cam all the time. Oh, okay. Oh, I did not know that. Dorgrim says, I actually have in my DM binder a cheat table for creating traps or hazards on the fly. Yeah, and uh, the... Da, 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 let's go to... Here we go. This right here... This is all you need. Is it a setback? Is it dangerous? Is it deadly? And what are the damages that each trap will will provide? This can be a pitfall, a flame jet, a magic missile trap, a poison spray or something. This one little chart up here on page 121... Scale it to your encounter if you want, set the difficulty, and conveniently all your flame traps and your boulders falling downhill alike are going to be this difficult to dodge and deal this much damage. Quick and easy. Quick and easy. It does get into more detail if you want to go from there, but as a new DM, just reference 121 and here you go. Hi, Torchic. Welcome back. It's going to give you also some sample, uh, <coughs> pardon, some sample traps down here. A collapsing roof, a pit, a falling net. There's this, despite this being a big part of D&D, &D, there are two or three pages. Yep, look at that. That's even just all art. There's maybe two or three pages that mention traps specifically like this i mean others will mention a trap use the guide scale it have it be appropriate for what your players are doing you also use 5e numbers to keep in your head from sly flourish oh thank you for providing that link dorgrim bubonic says problem is rust monsters are very hungry and will go far to find food if they can't find it locally they can attack the Empire or be used to attack them. Yeah, that if you want to populate beasts like that, rust monsters don't eat people. They just eat their stuff if it's metal. They might live in the mountains because the mountains might actually be... Um, uh, you, if you have a, a naturalist in the group, 
They're like, whoa, mo rust monsters living here? I bet there's a ton of ore in these mountains. It must be very heavy and, and uh, well, pardon the pun, iron or copper or something along those lines. It could be a valuable resource to come back and report on. Maybe they get a little bonus for doing that, for, for describing the valley. Because in their report, there sure was nothing about rust monsters. But what would that mean? Rust monsters live there for a reason. And if the party just discovered an almost literal gold mine, that could be huge, both for the morale of Mesotopia or as a blow against the Empire. <laughs> Rust monsters are always hungry. Yeah, so let's go around with our little feelers and, and kind of bap at you and, you know, eat anything that's metal. Oh, I think hazards are also introduced the same way up here. Let me get over to it real quick. So there's traps, traps in play. Hmm. Disease, poison, exposure. By the way, if you're outside, it's not just day and night cycles. Do you want it to snow? Do you want it to rain? Do you want it to be cloudy and dim? Do you want it to be super windy? Or a fog? Here we go, dungeon hazards. So a hazard isn't necessarily like a trap, although it has elements of it. You know, mold, webs that slow you down, things along those lines. Consider traps and hazards alike, random encounters with friendly, neutral, or unfriendly creatures, and go from there. Okay, I gotta drink something. My, my voice was getting a little hoarse there, and uh, Upos, good morning to you. I'm about ready to go on break, so I will, uh, I'll be back shortly, and we'll go into part three, and we can continue talking about this dungeon or other things that you've provided or generated.